Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multimillionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today you guys are in for a really special treat. And before I go on about Max's accomplishments, I'd really like to take a second first and talk about the man as I know him. Um, Because I haven't known Max for a long time, but when I first met him, I was in L.A. visiting some good friends, and about five of us all together went out for dinner, Max included, and I didn't really know what to expect, uh, but very, very quickly, I grew to really love and respect Max. Um, He's just so well-spoken, articulate, the way he even spoke and treated the wait staff, you can just tell he's one of those old-school, chivalrous gentlemen. Um, and I could also tell he really lives life to the fullest, both because of how hard and how how driven he is and how he just keeps reaching and reaching and reaching, but also from the hilarious practical jokes he plays on his friends, the camaraderie you hear in his voice when he talks about helping other people and those close to him. And it's just really extremely refreshing and inspiring to meet someone so down to earth, personable, who's such a good person, who has also achieved extreme levels of success. Um, In his early days, he attended Columbia University on an academic scholarship majoring in economics and German. As a walk-on to the Columbia football team, he earned the All-Ivy honors while setting five school records and one NCAA record for punt and kickoff returns. After graduating, he went to Navy flight training, earned Top Gun fighter pilot distinction, and went on to fly over 100 combat missions in North Vietnam off the carrier USS Midway. Um, After he finished his military career, he led a very distinguished business career, creating, launching, and scaling entrepreneurial enterprises domestically and around the world. Additionally, through the consulting firm CRD, he has assisted entrepreneurs everywhere in creating sustainable, fast growth by mastering principles of market differentiation, competitive advantage, and outcomes positioning to drive sales acceleration. The dramatic success of these principles in action has grown his company CRD into a prestigious outcome-driven consulting firm that guarantees increased sales. The proof is always in the pudding, and as part of his proof, he is the founding board member and chief strategic officer for Outback Steakhouse, which went from one restaurant to 2,000 restaurants in 20 years, K-Force, which had their initial public offering in 95 at $35 million. In 2012, their revenues were over $1 billion and still growing, Crosswalk.com, which was America's largest Christian internet site, Lime Energy, $4 million to $100 plus million revenue in five years, which includes going public. And he's also the founder or co-founder of a handful of companies, CRD, which is America's premier sales acceleration company since 81, CRD Capital, which does buy-side target investor analysis for investment banks, CRD Analytics, which built NASDAQ's first sustainability index, the NASDAQ OMX CRD Global Sustainability Index. He's also a founder, co-founder of uh, Guardian Lion Wireless, launched the world's first ever 24-7 GPS cellular phone uh, wristwatch for little children to prevent child uh, pred- uh, well, I guess predation. Carp Vita Inc. which sees life, online education menus for organic food products to promote health, vitality, and well-being. A uh, really cool project we talked about over dinner was Rex EMS, which is the f- world's first foldable, lightweight, transportable stretcher that ex- ex- facilitates rapid extraction of crisis victims in chaotic and battlefield environments by a single rescuer, which is really cool if you know anything about that. Buzz Eon, which exploiting, is exploiting online networks for entrepreneurial companies. They provide a seamless turnkey 24-7 strategic partner to optimize the marketing, sales, impression, and revenue power of the internet driving competitive advantage as part of the overall go-to market strategy. His awards and recognitions in 86, he was a Vietnam veteran small business person of the year. Uh, 87, his company, his consulting firm was on the Inc. magazine uh, list of 500 fastest growing companies. In 88, he was the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce small business person of the year. In 91, the SBA uh, nominated him natural veteran advocate of the year. In 99, he published his best-selling book, The Superman Complex. In 2000, he was awarded the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award. And of course, 
As you can tell from this long list of accomplishments and just striving to do the best, he's a top-rated speaker in the world's largest, most prestigious CEO art organization, Vistage, and he's made over 600 strategy presentations to companies to help them navigate the treacherous entrepreneurial waters. And again, talking about giving back, he loves mentoring and coaching young men, and he's also the founder of Wingspread, a nonprofit organization for children. Max. You are such yes. a busy man. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with us. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. It's a treat for both of us. I sort of wish my parents could have been here to hear your introduction. My my, uh, dad, my, my dad would have enjoyed it. My mom would have believed it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thrill to be here. And, and the last thing you said is, is one of the most important things in my life now, which is coaching and mentoring others. And peers, uh, but largely younger, younger, younger gentlemen, people earlier in their careers trying to make the tough calls that they need to to, to chart a proper life. And if uh, through this uh, time together today we're able to reach, uh, gosh, you know, I, I, being humble, even one, even change the destiny of even one person, much less many people that, that listen to your podcast, uh, and this will be eternally, um, eternally special for me. Yeah, no, and you're right. And and I definitely, definitely can tell that in your voice. And again, we have a mutual friend, Mark Lack. We actually did an interview with him as well. And um, yeah, you're just such an awesome, <laughs> Max. I just really enjoyed that, especially the practical jokes that you play, like the extent that you went to just to like put a smile on someone's face. It's just awesome. So um, how did you get started in all this? Because one of the things that interests interest me most about your story is that, you know, you weren't like knocking on doors selling Avon as a kid. You, you had a military background, but then you transferred and took these transferable skills, whatever they were, maybe we'll talk about those, and went into business and just like just crushed it. So how did you even get started? Like how did you even get into entrepreneurship? Well, I came out of a, of a, of a, of a very special family, uh, started out in Queens, New York. It was a dual immigrant family. My mom was a German immigrant. My dad's dad came from Ireland to be a New York City policeman. And in fact, one of my family heirlooms is his nightstick. Oh, wow. He died. He died early. But the the outcropping of that was that this dynamic mixture of my parents with an, with an immigrant attitude. And my mother, you know, at my dinner table at night, my mother at one end of the dinner table, uh, the, the Prussian German that she was, exhorting us to set goals and achieve. You know, pounding the table. You can do this. You can achieve this. Give it a shot. Go for the best. Settle for what you must, but go for the best. And my dad, the Irishman, at the other end saying, oh, let's have a drink and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> As I got older, I started moving to the other end, uh, to my dad's end of the true. table. Yeah, I know. We had, we had so much wine that night. It was, it was great wine. It was delicious. But <laughs> well, the, the attitudes that I learned early on were, were that of achievement and excellence. Shoot for the stars and take what you have to, but regroup and do it again. And so, funny enough, that, that family and that nuclear unit, um, I am four, uh, three siblings, sister and two brothers, all became entrepreneurs along the way. Oh, wow. Wow. In my particular case, it was uh, as a fast-track executive in a, in a wonderful company working for a great entrepreneur by the name of Patrick G. Ryan, who uh, built Aon, the largest insurance brokerage in the world from scratch. It's just an amazing man. I was like employee number 51. It was there in the very early days. And I had the good fortune of, of working for him. I, I moved through the company very quickly. No one had ever moved quite as quickly from field sales to district manager to area manager to regional manager to national marketing manager all in about a five-year period. Wow. I got to the home office. It, my dream, it was my dream, go to the home office, Chicago, Illinois, have a corporate career. And when I got there, I had a startling realization, and that was that I was not good in a corporate environment. <laughs> I, I tend to be very pragmatic. For me, the end justifies the means. I'm a little Machiavellian, and, and the way that I accomplish things, always working toward the good, but doing the smartest thing at this moment to make it happen. And I wasn't good in a corporate structure that required permission and consensus, and, and, and not that I'm not a team player. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a squadron guy. I, you know, I, I flew combat aircraft with my wingman, but I just couldn't stand wasting time or energy, and so it became clear to me that that I, 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 could, I couldn't stay in, in the home office, and there was no job higher than mine at that point outside the home office. And, and so I was led to one conclusion, that was I have to leave, and I have to start a business. And that was 1981, and that's exactly what I did. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. And I think a lot of people listening might be able to relate to that. Jim Rohn has a quote that I love, and he's like, uh, what is it? He, a salary will, or was it? A salary will earn you a living, but profits will earn you a fortune. And it sounds kind of like exactly that. And I know what you mean, the corporate thing. It can be really stifling to try to do everything by committee. And so I don't, like, again, I think you can be a team player, but understand that, you know, when your results, when you're a results oriented person, you get frustrated as you should be. You should be patiently impatient or impatiently yeah. patient with, uh, with the delays strong. and progress. Right, right, right. So what happened then? So you just, you just left or what was your plan? When you I, I, made the, I made the worst decision I ever made in my life. <laughs> I, uh, I quit my job. Um, okay. Pat, had just, uh, Pat Ryan had just put me through the executive MBA program at the University of Chicago, which was a weekend program for executives, which was marvelous. And, and um, I loaded up my wife, my dear wife, and three little children. One was my son, who was just a couple of months old, and put him into the back of, a, of an Oldsmobile Cutlass station wagon and drove from Chicago, Illinois, to Atlanta, Georgia, and started a business from scratch. I mean from scratch. I don't mean no existing relationships, no existing clients. It was absolute insanity. And I paid for it for about two years. I went, I went through every ignominious, embarrassing, humiliating thing <laughs> you go through because I had no idea what it took to run the business. I had no idea what it took to get, build a client base. I had no, no idea how much capital it would need. And my dear wife, who's, by the way, we'll celebrate um, next week our 43rd wedding anniversary. Awesome. She was right there with me. And, you know, one of the, one of the worst moments was she was uh, standing in her driveway in a nice neighborhood. We'd, we bought a nice house and uh, talking to her neighbor and a tow truck pulled up and said, are you Susan Carey? She said, yes. And he backed the tow truck into the driveway and repossessed her car. Her name is this. I, I, so she calls me. I come home from work. She's upset, but she actually handled it beautifully in front of the neighbor. She, I said, well, what did you do in front of the neighbor? Was there any way to sort of to, to save face, yeah, save face, you know? She goes, yeah. She said, I looked at her. I said, oh, that Max. What a fun store. Always having surprise repairs done on my car. <laughs> <laughs> You are a bit of a jokester, so uh, I am. <laughs> so, um, no, that's as that's as bad as it got. And then gradually we figured out how to run a business, and and then we um, we started to build and have uh, you know that's 1981. CRD is still around, still vibrant, still um, charting courses for entrepreneurs, still delivering competitive advantage mm -hmm. to entrepreneurs that are fighting commodity or large, powerful competitors. So we're yeah. It, uh, it, it, it worked, and along the way, I got some other breaks. Yeah, yeah I guess that's it, right? Isn't that, uh, was, I don't know if it's Abraham Lincoln. I'll, you know, I'll study, I'll train, and one, someday maybe my time will come. What was it that, that changed over the two years? Like, what were you doing wrong in the beginning that you then figured out? Well, there's, there's a naivete that, that comes with, um, with entrepreneurship. I, I do a lot of speaking, Frank Magazine, and I often... Uh, choose to speak to what we call pre-entrepreneurs, people that are thinking about starting a business. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the, with all the pain in the corporate world these days, and downsizing, and you know, replaced you know, technology replacing people. I mean, there are a lot of displaced people, and unfortunately, when you don't see other alternatives um, readily uh, available to you, one of the solutions that suggests is suggested to you is to start a business. Right. And. And I feel it's my responsibility to tell them the truth. So these people come together. I get a thousand people in a room, and and they're going to start. They're so excited. They're going to take their life savings. They're going to start a business. Right. And and so my job is to, is to add clarity and, and truth to that. So I open. I have a I, I have a great opening. I think for them to catch their attention. I say, uh, you all want to become entrepreneurs. Now raise their hands. I say, okay. I said, tell me, how do you become an entrepreneur? And I say, then they say, first answer is I make them shout it out. They say, well, you got a good idea. I say, great, okay. What's the next step? They say, you quit your job. <laughs> I said, well, here's where we have our first disconnect. We have a little bit of a disconnect here, uh, semantic disconnect. They said, because when you quit your job, you don't become an entrepreneur. When you quit your job, you become unemployed. Right. <laughs> and entrepreneurship is the art form of becoming employed in your new business. And when you started, you are not employed. You are unemployed. So I asked him a question. I said, how many of you have ever been unemployed before? No hands go up. How many of you have ever taken a course in being unemployed? Right. 
How many of you have, have taken time to understand what it's like psychologically, physiologically, economically, financially, and within the family, relationally within your family, to be unemployed? Yeah. And they all look and then no hands go up. I said, so you're embarking on a career where the predictable outcome is something that you've never done and are not prepared for. So I suggest you step back and you, and you rethink this issue. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you to be soulfully honest painfully honest and as you consider that decision right about what you're getting into because the reality is a lot of people use hope as a strategy and hope is not a strategy hope is a very very terrible strategy to have i mean you need yeah. hope but exactly like i know from when we talked to you you are you are all about preparation and practice i mean you talked about how many hours you spent in the simulator for flight school and just drilling 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 and preparing and just and 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 just how important that is. I mean, Voltaire is a quote, a plan means nothing, but planning is everything. And I think that you, it sounds like you really embody that. So, Eisenhower, By the way, Eisenhower said the same thing. He said the most important aspect to winning a war or a battle is to show up with a great plan. And the plan is valid right up until the first shot is fired. <laughs> that's right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's excellent. I love that. Eisenhower, Eisenhower said it? Yes, he did. Okay. He did. Uh, people ask me this, too, well, well, why are you successful? And I, and I, I have to be really candid with you, Dale. I, I don't consider myself to be all that successful. I've had, uh, as you know, a number of, of successes, and I've had some major, major, major setbacks, even, even late in life with 9-11 and some other, uh, other situations. But the, but, the, but the answer that I give them, and it starts with those pre-entrepreneurs, is that, that as an entrepreneur, especially early on, you get a thousand chances a day to quit. You get a thousand reasons every day and a thousand chances every day to quit. And you take one of those chances, you take one of those opportunities to quit and you're no longer an entrepreneur. And then you, and then you are, by, certainly by some definitions, a failure. And so entrepreneurship is, is, is just simply about not quitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have other rules as we go through our time together here that I'd be happy to share, but that's where it starts. Right, right, right. Of course, yeah, to get anywhere. Uh, you need to be persistent and dedicated to it. Do you believe in the whole 10,000 hour ideal? Like, is that something that anyone listening to this, whatever, regardless of whatever stage they're in their business, if they're, you know, frustrated or, or upset or something, they just need to put in more hours to become more proficient and to break through whatever's holding them back? Well, I, I, yes, yes and no. I, I don't believe there's any substitute for sacrifice and persistence and hard work. I, I just, I've never been able to find it. Now, you know, there have been some entrepreneurs that we all know that are highly visible that, that were magical, right out of right. the box. And right. you can, it doesn't take you far to, to take too long to see them. And, and that, that's another whole, whole uh, phenomenon. Uh, and I was never, I was never quite allowed that, uh, that grace. So, so, so what do you do when, when things aren't going your way? I, I've cracked a couple of, of codes uh, I've one I know I think we talked about the, the other night, but the correct some codes about how to how to grow a business and what you do when 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 things are not working, and most uh, well the, the principle is this: businesses function exactly as they're designed to function, and businesses function. So I can tell an entrepreneur, like let me write the eye, say your business is functioning exactly as it's designed to function. He said, well, it's not working at all. I said, I get that, and I'm telling you that that's a design issue first. It's a design of your business model first. And most of us, when we start an entrepreneurial company, we build it based on behavior, not based on design. We have great behaviors of our own, tenacity, uh, persistence, mm -hmm. intuition, knowledge, and we bring that to bear. And then we go out and we hire people that, that mimic that, that have great intensity and great fire in their belly and all those wonderful things. But as the business as it starts to, to gain traction, relying on people's behavior is no longer enough to drive a great business consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and entrepreneurs don't get that. And so the response to, to, a, to a setback or a downturn or you know, not being able to respond to a competitor is to work harder, sell harder, put in more time, more energy, more stress, and, that, and that's not the solution. The solution is to pull back and to find out where your strategy is broken. Mm. So being a military guy, I, you know, when I flew combat, I flew off an aircraft carrier into, uh, in the middle of the night in an airplane all by myself, a single-seat pilot, 
and st- at four o'clock in the morning into a monsoon storm to go and fight over the most heavily defended skies in the world outside of Mother Russia, and that was North Vietnam. So you say, well, well, what, what, what do you need to know before they punch you off the front of the deck? And we used to laughingly say, by the time we got shot off the deck, we also had three, we already had three things going against us. We were a heavier than air, b low on fuel, and c already on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so you say, so I would ask you, so well, if you're going to fly into the jaws of danger in the middle of that, what would you want to know about where you're going, and what in, what, what intelligence would you want? Right, you got to know the weather. You got to know the geography. You got to know the best way in and the best way out. Even if the, you have to know where the moon is, because you don't want to put your airplane between a shooter and the moon, because it's like taking a Polaroid picture. Okay, we actually rated there. We actually rated the shooters on the ground. We had the good shooters and the bad shooters. And of course, our goal was to have the Navy guys fly over the bad shooters and have the Air Force guys fly over the good shooters. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Actually, there's some truth. So, so we became a, not addicted, but, but but certainly heavily reliant on intelligence. Uh-huh. We would do nothing without intel, and so that that transfers for me. That transfers over into business. So the most important thing in your business is not your energy and your and your vitality. It's the strategy of your company, uh-huh. and the business model that supports that strategy. And you cannot here it is. There can be no. The, you know, the, the, ultimately, there can be no success without strategy, and there can be no strategy without intelligence. So we spend a lot of our time, and you talked about preparation and practice, we spend a lot of our time on research and discovery and intelligence gathering uh, before we make a move. You know, that's such a key point, too. I, uh, a friend of mine, Ty Lopez, was talking about, um, I think it was him that interviewed, but somewhere I heard about an interview with Warren Buffett talking about what one skill helped him achieve his success, and he said it was the ability to say no. Because most of us were just saying yes to everything. And what you said, that I mean, that sounds, it sounds almost like similar to that, where for you it's just the ability to say no and hold off until you're confident that you have, like, until you're confident that the strategy, the plan will execute as expected. Exactly right. When when people ask me, how did Outback go from one to two thousand restaurants in twenty years? And a very simple answer to that: we were built to grow. We had a design for growth. We had the DNA of growth. We spent so much time designing our business model, our service model, our cooking model, our customer model, our hospitality model, and making sure that it was perfect. And then. When you have a design that's perfect, then you, grew, you bring in great people who have that great energy and tenacity and commitment to excellence, and you marry the two up. You bring them, and that's when magic takes place. Same with gay force. Same with crosswalk. Same with Lyme. So it's design first, and then it's behavior second. So, so let, me give you, let me put this in perspective. If we get, and so when we go into these entrepreneurial companies that hire CRD, to accelerate their sales, that's what we do. And we contractually, after 30 plus years of being in business, we contractually agree, commit to increasing their sales. So obviously we gotta be pretty good. Right. So it's not uncommon for us. If we were taking an entrepreneurial company and we decided that they had a product worthy of selling to Home Depot or Walmart or some big box, it's not unlikely for us to expend 50% of the total sales resources that's ultimately all the resources that would be thrown at this possibility, this sales opportunity. It's not unusual for us to expend 50% of the, those resources up front before we ever make a contact to the target company. Really, eh? So you say, well, what, what are you studying? Well, I'm studying their business model. Right. What are you st- I'm studying their growth curve. I'm, stu- I'm, I'm studying their strategic intent. I'm studying what the... Um, what the CEO told the shareholders about the future of the company and what the five-year plan is and the three-year plan. And somehow, we're going to marry up our, co- our client's strategy with a strategy that's already been consecrated at Walmart or Walmart or wherever we're trying to go. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So how and do you, it works. Yeah, so how... How do you? How does someone even begin? Like, or, so someone's listening to the call. They're like, "All right, gung ho, I'm all about this. I got to do the, my research strategy." So, what am I? What am I looking at? Where do I go? Is it the SBA you get the stats? Are you looking at? Past- well, so you know, it starts. It starts being internet driven, and we actually go a step further. We hire college interns to help on the intelligence side, and for every every of our clients, all the clients that engage us, uh, we help them select and hire college interns to do the marketing intel. It's a it's a it's a be- it's a beautiful thing. Right, right, right. 
It is because you get these young, fresh, rabid minds that want to flex those muscles, and you know, and you give them direction and resources and and encouragement and an opportunity to kind of demonstrate themselves and apply what they're learning. Because that's a huge problem, I think, personally. This is my own personal philosophy, but with education today, is people just you know, I'm I'm a big firm believer in preparation. But you prepare for eight years, you come out, and the job you've been training for, you know, doesn't either doesn't exist or it's evolved, and a lot of what you learned is is gone and they don't have the experience it's okay if you got the experience along the way but so it sounds like it's great for everyone it's a win-win for everyone involved now well the uh, in line with what you said is what you gained in that educational process was the ability to learn how to learn right. and that's what becomes valuable i am a and mark and jason and all of us brian and and john and duke and uh, we are we are ferocious learners mm-hmm. Every day is what? What can we learn about this target? What can we learn about this marketplace? What can we learn about about these trends? So I can I can give you if you want, Daryl. I can give you five quick steps as to how to formulate a strategy. Because as a consultant, I spend a lot of our time doing two things. Number one is taking the abstract and make it real. So when people use an abstract term like strategy or um, consultative selling or customer intimacy, you have to reduce that to, to something real. Mm-hmm. These are all just abstract terms that sound good. So you take the abstract and make it real, and then as difficult or, or even more difficult, you have to take the complex and make it simple. Mm-hmm. So we've become, and you say, what, well, one of, one of the things you, you learned along the way, one of them is, is it's all about simplicity. So you constantly have to be taking complex ideas, complex designs, and making them more and more simple because people today cannot and will not sustainably execute complex things. Right, right, right. Yep. And the good news is that if you take the time and energy to pursue it, you can make them simple. Right. And right. so we do that. That's why it's executable. That's why we can increase sales. So do you, do you want me to quickly go through the five? Yes, or yes is, please. Yes, please. Yep. Right. Well, the first, the first is these are questions they need to ask themselves or their, their team. And if it's like me, if they're starting out by themselves, they just get in the mirror and ask themselves. First, first off is, what is your value creation strategy? How do you create value for your customers? Not what product you sell, not what benefits do you bring, ease of use. No, what, how do you create value for them? And then the, the second part of the same question is, how do you measure that value? You know, we're all about trying to help people act like a market leader. And so market leaders provide benchmarks and metrics to measure their success. And then they invent those benchmarks and metrics, and then they own the category. Mm. And so it doesn't matter how big you are, you can still act like a market leader and be perceived by a market leader. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. So, and so that then the, the next part of that question is, so it's how do you create that? What's your value creation strategy? How do you create value? Number two, how do you measure it? Number two, how does your customer embrace your value? And how do they measure it? Do they measure it? And if they aren't measuring it, they should be measuring it. And that's your job. Mm-hmm. So I ask these entrepreneurs, I'll get 15 in a group uh, four times a month. Great entrepreneurs, running successful entrepreneurial companies uh, through the Vistage organization. And so I'll ask them, i say, how many of you, raise your hand if in the last year you've had a dis- you've led off a discussion with your leadership team starting with how do we create value for our customers? Not again, not, not what product do we sell, what service we've, and at most I'll get one hand out of the 15. So this is new uncharted territory. Okay, second, what's your uh, value proposition strategy? And so very simply, and you hear that term coming up, so let's reduce that abstraction. What's your value proposition strategy? That's how you articulate your value creation strategy, how you articulate, how you explain your value creation strategy to your best target customers and prospects in a way that they can do four things. So how you describe your value creation, your ability to create value to your best target customers and prospects, so they can do four things. Number one, embrace it, means that they see it and want it. Number two, engage it, means they hire you. Number three, leverage it, means they let you come in and do what you do best. And number four, defend it, because they're going to have to defend you inside against other inside motives and outside uh, attack. Quickly, Two caveats to that. Number one, by, by definition, that value proposition must create competitive advantage for your company. In other words, it must distance you from the competitors. And I know that's a, that's a tall order, but it's fact. Mm-hmm. And the second is, regardless of the size of your company, you, as the CEO, you owe that value proposition to your company. 
And in most companies, Daryl, it's, it's, it's delegated at least to the vice president of sales, maybe to the sales manager, and in many cases, it's dele delegated all the way down to the salesperson. Really? Here's your product, here's your service, here's your benefit statement, go get them. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I remember we talked about that over dinner, saying that a lot of companies or sales teams just are fragmented. They're not a unified whole, and there's no... You know, just for a lot of them, exactly that. They're just like, here's... here's now they're selling, they're selling by behavior, not by design. Right. And that's killer. Yep. No, no company got great without great sales design. And that means just as much design specificity in how they sell as to the blueprints on how they build computers, design software, build a building, or install capital equipment. Right. You have as much ability to have spe specific design in your selling side as you do on your operational side. Yep. Third I rule... Third, third, third strategy rule, what's your customer acquisition strategy? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where nobody gets here. What's your customer acquisition strategy? Well, we go out and get customers. Mm -hmm. well, who picks the customers? Well, the salespeople do. Or people uh, contact us. They respond to a mail or a, uh, um, an ad. They uh, go to our website. They show up. They show up. Yep. I said, well, if, if they show up, if they, if they show up based on something your company did, which I think is wonderful, Who's in control of who your next customer is? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Most, they are. Most companies have no plan to buy customers, and the idea seems foreign to them. Exactly. So, so how about this? How about you determine the profile of the kind of company that can best and would most va best use your services and most value your services? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you go out and you target them. Yep. And that's what we do with companies. So we ask a question of the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial companies. Great question, Daryl, for all your listeners. For entrepreneurs far and wide, what percentage of the available universe of companies or individuals that could use what you have, what percentage of the available universe of companies or individuals that could buy what you sell do you have to effectively sell to and close in the next 12 months to have yourself a great year? Mm. The answer, unilaterally, Daryl, is 1% or less. 1% really? or less. So I so, said, well, then your, your challenge is not to go out there and be all things to all people. Your challenge is to find the best 1%. That's right. And be prepared to walk away from deals that don't fit your profile, that don't buy your business model, that won't pay you with prices. I love that. Okay, that's number three. Number four, what's your pricing strategy? And here the idea is not what do you charge or are you going to be the low-cost guys, which is not a good idea, but can you use pricing as a tool? Can you use creative pricing to make yourself more valuable to your best target 1%. Mm. And then finally, and finally, number five is, what's your defensive strategy? Once you get in there, how are you going to protect yourselves? How are you going to stay? Because you're going to come under attack. Mm. There's a, a lesson I learned from the venture capital community years ago making presentations and went into one of my early presentations, and the first question they asked me was, uh, what's your product? And I explained it pretty well. And they said, and they said what's your uh, market? You did a pretty good job with that. The third question, and this, this really blew me away, was what's your exit strategy? Mm, we haven't even launched the company yet. And they're asking, what's your, what's your exit strategy? So when I pulled back after that, I thought about it. Because they wanted to know how to get their money out. They, their, their position was, before you even do it, Decide the end game. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that, that starts a business is looking to get out in three years, as, as the VCs want you to do, but let's transfer that methodology. If you know you're going to be attacked when you get into an account because you're taking it from someone else and you're smaller and you have less resources than some of the big guys, don't wait till that happens to figure out your defensive strategy. Right. When, do you, when do you think you ought to figure the defensive strategy? Right, before you even go in. Before you even go in. And so those five things sort of revela are revelationary to the entrepreneurial community, and it gives us a framework to start. Mm -hmm. and, and there are, there, there, I'll give you two summation statements, and then we can go wherever else you want. Say, so, well, what's the easiest way to start a strategy? Okay, well, first is you determine the answer to the following question. What is it that you can enable? Here's the key word, enable. Forget your product and your service. What is it that you can enable? What is it that you can enable your customer to do with you that they can't do with anyone else, any of your competitors. Mm. So, well, can they get 
product? Sure. Can they get good service? Sure. What is it that you can enable them to do that they can't do with their competitors? And it causes you to go to the place above product and service where true value exists. Things like, can you impact their business model? Can you uh, be accretive to their value proposition? Can you enhance their competitive advantage? Can you give them speed to market advantage? Can you take them to a different demographic than they've been to before? Can you expand their reach? Can you, all questions that deal with their business model. And so then you ask a question. So if I asked you to go out and impact somebody's business model, what would you first have to know? You have to understand the model. Understand the model. Back to intelligence, okay? So that's, that's the first trick, and the second trick is, same question, phrased slightly differently. Who is it on the other side of the table that you can, on the target company, that, who is it on the other side of the table that you can assist, or you can empower to accomplish something with you that they can't accomplish with your competitor? So now we make it personal. Now it's an individual. Who is it that you can empower to do something with you that they couldn't do with someone else? And so now we're making it personal. Whose career could you impact? Who could you move to the top of their uh, top of their heap? Who could you who could you get recognized and help earn a bonus if you do what you're supposed to do? So part of that intelligence gathering is answering those two questions and finding that into that individual. Simply stated, you want to sell to the person who has the most to gain or the most to lose. Period. And very rarely is it the procurement guy or the buyer. I'm taking notes as we talk. This is all great questions. Anyone who's listening, you're probably going to want to re-listen to this and, and write these down and answer them. And what I love is that, you know, it's not like easy, quick answers. And some people might be like, oh, my head hurts from thinking, but that's the real, like, you know, some of these questions aren't easy to answer, but that's that's the game. It's, it's you've, like, that's what it's going to take to win, right? I mean, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, so but There is always a way. There's always a way for a strategy if you have the right intelligence. And sometimes you have to dig. I mean, my mom, I told you she was an elegant immigrant, can-do attitude. And she taught me a rule years ago. She said, we, you know, I said, well, I've decided this. I think I found the solution. She said, before you do that, just one more, one more swipe at it. Which solution have you not found yet? Mm. Which solution have you not seen yet? Go back one more time. And it was amazing how many times you go back and then, and then the breakthrough happens. That's awesome. That's so I awesome. hope I'm not being too didactic. No, or too no, no, no. This is perfect. This is no, Max. I mean, obviously, you've you've been there. You've seen. You've been there, done that. You're coming back, and you're you're sharing the wisdom with everyone. And so, no, I think, um, no, it's fine. You're 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 perfect. One thing I did want to ask you about when we were having dinner, you talked about most. You know, it's it's about getting up and running with the model, and then getting the model dialed in. Can we talk? Speak to that a little bit about like. Like, how do you tweak a model and how do you test it? How did, because I think a lot of business owners, they're kind of afraid to make certain changes. You know, how do I, you know, test different pricing? How do I, how do I do something totally different without cannibalizing my existing customers? And I know that that's something we've already talked about here is getting the model right, getting the design right. So how, do you have any suggestions for someone who's, they're like, all right, I have a business and I think I've got a design flaw. And like, so what do I do? How do I, how do I make a change and implement it without, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak? Um, well, first of all, I'll tell you why, why it's been so frustrating in the past. Uh, we did a research project with, uh, with Vistage, and nine out of ten Vistage companies, now these are successful entrepreneurial companies. Right. These are 10,000 CEOs running businesses anywhere on the small side from three to five million up to a billion. Mm -hmm. These are successful, okay? Mm -hmm. And we asked them, uh, <clears throat> And here's the, here's the conclusion after this little research junket. Nine out of, true or false question, nine out of ten entrepreneurial CEOs, Vistage CEOs, make product, service, innovation, launch, differentiation, deletions, partnership decisions. So launching, launching a new product, innovating a new product, launching a new service, innovating a new service, picking a new partner. Nine out of 10 CEOs make those decisions without ever, ever talking to a customer or a prospect. Oh, that's true. true. So, and so that's, that's the starting reality. So just by virtue of reversing that paradigm and starting with intelligence, you're going to, you're going to drill intelligence until you find uh, an avenue that, that aligns with your strength.
So, so it's not unlikely. Once again, and, and anybody can do this. You know, we we have we call and we have we have a research people, and they call and they interview senior executives in a target company. And they simply say, we're doing research, and here you're a thought leader in your space. I talk to you about strategy. Nine, eight or nine out of ten executives take that call. So how's your business model changing? Where's your greatest pain? What is the CEO? Where's the pressure moving forward? What's the international competition done to you? And they tell us how, how their strategy is evolving. And if we get that from five, six, seven, eight different companies, now we know that it's consistent, it's real. Then we'll pull back and say, okay, design your business to help them get where they need to get. And, um, I mean, and, and that's what you have to do. Yep, yep, yep. No, that's excellent. That's good. That's really good. And just, and again, and just test it. And to, to I guess, maybe take a small group of people and just have that be a beta project for them. Absolutely. Once again, back to those interns. Put the interns on the phone. Mm -hmm. Tell them they're, they're, they're doing a school project. They're a marketing major. It's not about strategy. People will take the call. I mean, we go to great lengths to, to capture research. We'll do anything it takes to get the right, to, to get the right to get, to get the right research. Right, right. Well, because it's so critical. I mean, if you make the wrong decision, bad data will kill businesses faster than anything else. Because it's like you're flying blind. You, you're just you're guessing at that point. Um, and in, within the company, as you just it, within the company, you don't get good information uh, flowing up from well, however your organization, whether it's five or ten or fifteen or twenty people. Good information doesn't flow up. Salesperson loses the deal. What does the salesperson say? Oh, well, we were too expensive. We were too expensive. Yeah. The other, the other guy, the other guys, they, they cut our price. Is that true? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But it, but but there are two two realities. If it isn't true, we got to find out what the real what the real lay of the land was. And number two, if it is true, then we didn't sell well. Mm. Then we didn't have a good sales design. So, well, the bids are in, and so we'll let you know how you did. So, great. Let me ask you, you know, you've been conducting this um, uh, this process for your company. Uh, we've had a chance to meet a couple of times, present our value proposition. Um, are we going to win? No, they're going to say, well, I can't tell you that because I don't know what the committee, you know, whatever, what the other guy's going to say. Say, great, I understand that. Let me ask you this. If it were your decision to make today, if you were, would you choose us? And I said, well, no, I'm not sure I would. Now, now I know where the disconnect is. Mm -hmm. So it, it, a lot of this, you know, once you get the design right, then it's the techniques and the tactics to get to, to pure pure information. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's so you, powerful. You put as, as one of your questions um, to answer today, I want to make sure this came out. It's, it, you said, well, you know, what, what did you learn? What's the most important thing you learned along the way? And, of course, that's incalculable because I've learned so much and I'm still learning. Um, but one thing, and it was not long ago that I learned it, and it could save, it could save me, I think, a lot of heartache, and that is uh, you never make business decisions out of fear. You never make business decisions out of fear. And I looked at my, God, the first 20 years of my entrepreneurial career, every decision I made, I made out of fear. Oh, if I don't do this, this person's going to leave. Oh, this person, I really need that person. If I don't do this, they're not going to, they're not going to be happy. If I, if I don't do this for this client, I might lose them. I'm going to change my business model for them, which isn't a good idea, but I have to because I'm afraid. And, I, and it also conforms, I'm a Christian, as I think you know, it, it also conforms with, with biblical guidance. Yeah, 365 times in the Bible it says, do not fear. One for every day of the year, do not fear. And one day... This entrepreneur explained this to me, and this light went on. And now I look at decisions, and, and I was always driven by what if. Well, if I make a decision, what if that person does it? And now I make the best decision, and it's amazing how easily it is to live with how easy it is to live with the consequences. Right, 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 right. No, I think that's a valid point. In fact, it's a different analogy, but for me, it's actually been helping me with chess. I play a lot of chess, and huh? I have a friend that's just been kicking my butt left, right, and center, and I watched. Uh, like a video on YouTube, and the gentleman was explaining almost like what you said. He's he was going through a game where he was so reactionary 
to what the other guy was doing, he just kept getting backed into a corner even more and more and more. And he was talking about how once he realized that and started imposing his own plan instead of reacting to the other guy's plan, it flipped the script for him. And that's exactly what I feel like it's done for in chess. And that's almost what you're saying. If you're in fear and you're reacting too much, you're not implementing your own plan, which I think goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the call about planning being so important. And even though the plan, what was the Eisenhower quote? Is that uh, planning, having a plan is the most important aspect to winning a battle, a war, or a battle, uh, a particular battle, and that plan is valid right up until the first shot is fired. Right, right, which is so true. Like, I just, I love that, though, but it's, you just got to be prepared, and you just need some direction. Um, so anyways, no, I love that. That's great, and I think, I think, I, yeah, I mean, I haven't built the companies you have by any means, but... Um, I think that's extremely valid, just even even knowing myself. And even from my martial arts background, having coached students and helped them go to competitions and win gold medals and that, you can see guys lose when they get on the mat. Like, they just, they get psyched out. They, you know, the other guy intimidates them. We used to do a thing in resting, and when we would rest, we would have a stare down. You'd rest, but you'd stare down your partner because you'd want to have that game face on because you wouldn't want and to show any sign of fear, and you wouldn't want to receive it either. So, yeah, no, I think that's really, really valid. So, what's... What are kind of the biggest mistakes we talked about? Like, kind of, I mean, we've gone over a lot of great stuff. There is so much content to this. I, I myself, am already gonna like. I've got. I, I didn't bring a pad of paper. I've got like forty post-it notes all around me right now for writing while you've been talking. But what are some of the biggest things you think that'll hold people back? Like when you go in and talk to a client, we've got you dropped a lot of wonderful gems here about the strategy and the questions that they need to ask themselves. Is there any sort of habitual thing that you see people doing to shoot themselves in the foot? Um, when they're, you know, when they're trying to get their businesses up and running, when people come to you and they're just, yeah, they're just either, uh, well, I don't want to say lost or struggling, but just in general, like, do you see people working really hard, but it would be better? I guess maybe it comes back to strategy. Um, it comes back to strategy. It comes back to design. And, uh, you know, there can be no strategy without intelligence. It, it, it's not that complicated. Uh, I, I will say that, that I've learned, I've seen sales go through, a couple of generational changes in my life. Uh, when I first started selling, it was about presentations. It was about going in and memorizing a presentation, making your presentation. And the only thing wrong with that was you didn't include the guy on the other side of the table. And over time, that that burned out. Uh, then we went to dialogue, from monologue selling to dialogue-based selling, which was uh, Xerox introduced questions. Tell me about your business. What, you know, tell me about your goals. So, and that worked great for a while because it was so new until everybody was asking the same empty questions. Right. So, so then I, I sort of helped perfect the third generation of selling, which is always show up um, with something of value, uh, that knowledge about them that shows that, that you've researched them and you know more about them than the last five guys that have called on them. Yeah. And you use that to disrupt the sale and take it in a different direction. The guy says, well, tell me you got 15 minutes. Tell me what you got. I said, I'd be happy to. But first, if you would just be kind enough to confirm three pieces of research that I found about your company and give me some insight as to how they're impacting the business, then I can tailor my presentation to you. Mm. All of a sudden, we've changed the direction, and I have control of the sale. Oh. I have no intention of making that presentation. But now, in the new world, what we've done is we've regressed, and we've gone back to Generation 1, and we've done it through a thing called a PowerPoint. And PowerPoints are a killer. I, I don't let any of our clients. Now, there is a place for PowerPoints later on, but not in the front zone. Yep, 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 and, yep. And here's the rule. Here's the rule that you should be able to, you need to be able to put your entire business model on one piece of paper. Mm. And if you want to see some of those, I can have Kimberly send you something. Your entire, I don't care how complex your business is, be able to put on one piece of paper and your, your opening sales call is you need all you need is that piece of paper, your intelligence, and a flip chart. And you do a Lou Holtz chalk talk. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the goal of the first time you meet with someone is not to sell them what you have, but you used the word earlier. You said you're really there to buy an opportunity. So we call the first meeting, and we tell the client, or the prospect this, we call it an alignment meeting. Yeah, you're so anyway. We, 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 we have to find out if you fit our profile and we fit yours. Mm -hmm. If not, we shouldn't be talking to each other. Yep. And so the meeting then is entirely differently in terms of different in terms of its structure, because I'm there trying to decide whether to buy this opportunity or not. Mm -hmm. And so we ask questions and we show you the, the, the characteristics that make somebody a good partner of mine. Mm, right. Hold hold different out. Is this you? Tell me if if you align with this. 
We don't want transactional relationships. We want consultative relationships. Is that, is that align with your thinking? Yeah. 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 So that may be a that may be will, will be a help to get it off on the right on the right foot. No, I think I think that's huge because myself, I consider myself like I'm a direct response database automation marketer. So that's everything. I mean, data is everything. You know, if people, humans have this weird thing, we prefer things that are custom fit for us, you know, and, and like when you buy a shoe, you don't just buy a general shoe, you buy a walking shoe, a hiking shoe, a running shoe. So, right. Yeah. So it's exactly what you're saying. You're saying again, the same thing out of the total available universe for you to have a large scale business, how, what percent do you need? If it's only 1%, what 1% is that? And then you want to design and model everything to optimize for that one function for that one client. Absolutely. Yeah. You, when you, you're so right, Daryl. When you go when you go shopping, you, you go to the cheese store. Okay. You go you go to the uh, when you have running shoes, you go to the running shoe store. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's always it's a, you, you want wine. You go to the wine store. It's, it's, it's always specialty driven. Yeah. By the way, that doesn't mean by, by taking narrow niches doesn't mean you don't get a chance to be big. When when Nike, the largest shoe manufacturer in the world, okay, athletic shoe manufacturer in the world, when they started, they came in narrow. Remember, they said, "Hey, listen, Adidas and Puma and Converse, you guys, you have you guys have all the worldwide market share. We just have this funny one little funny shoe, this little running shoe, and we're just coming into the running market. We're not going to bother anybody else." Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> then they take the running market and say, well, you know, we're going to do tennis shoes now, but don't worry, we're not going to go any further than that. We're going to not going to go to your core, your other core segments, and then one after another they took them out in every segment. Yeah. So, so there's a great precedent for that. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's, we call it, we say inch wide, mile deep, and that's exactly it. And you can always build a bridge to other markets, but the worst thing you can do is try to build a business that's for everybody because then it's for nobody because you're not really speaking anyone's language which is exactly what you're talking about with the intelligence and the recon and right so, so let me tell you what's possible um, you know I talk about uh, I'm working on a new presentation CEO presentation called 10 steps to being a market leader and it's 10 things 10 behaviors that if you do these behaviors by the way we're doing it with Buzzy on and Rex right now if you do these 10 steps the market will perceive you to be a market leader and uh, so, so the steps are one of the steps. The first step is innovate, and the next is change the game, and the other is is change the discussion, and the next is control the dialogue, and the next is give a new blueprint for execution, and other is provide benchmarks and metrics. All those things that we've talked about. So, this this wonderful prime time example of a, uh, of a couple of years ago, Netflix comes into an industry dominated by a giant blockbuster. Embedded, bricks and mortars, capital investment, great entrepreneurs, everybody lumped into one blockbuster. Impenetrable, right? <laughs> Netflix, Netflix comes up, starts up, and they innovate, and they change the game. How do they change the game? They change the blueprint for execution. They redefine the space. They say, wait a minute. This isn't about uh, content. This isn't about video content. You, you can get video content anywhere. It's not about video content. It's about the delivery vehicle, the channels with which people can access it. And we don't think it's smart for people to have to get in their car and drive down to your store, waste gas, waste time, get a babysitter. We think it's much smarter to have a different channel. And it's, we're just going to change the channel. It's the same content. We're just change the channel. We're going to make it cheaper, easier, faster, and more fun to navigate. They took out a market leader in a matter of months. They put Blockbuster into bankruptcy in a matter of months. Yeah. That's what's possible. Yeah, that's crazy. That's so crazy. And it's because they knew the real problem that they were solving for their clients. They had done the research and they, exactly. they they knew exactly what the problem was. And so I always relate that to newspapers because I think it's the same thing. People get confused. The newspapers thought they were just delivering wads of advertising to people with interesting stories in it. But that wasn't the problem that they were solving for people. And that's why I think so many of them had a hard time adapting. Um, because they just forgot the game that they were playing, and it's exactly it sounds like what Blockbuster was doing. They were so caught up in the tactics that they weren't they weren't tied to the mission. Exactly, they forgot that the that the core had changed, that the consumer preference was changing, that they were anachronistic, they were out of step, yep. and it just took one smart little company to come in and take them out with nothing, no brick and mortar, no nothing, yep. just a strategy. Yep, yep. And Netflix is such an interesting story as well. 
even uh, yeah, <laughs> I go to tangent like that. But they totally dom. You're right. They totally dominate online, and they got their offer f- dialed in. They had their their USP, I guess. It was their free, and their their winning uh, their winning campaign, which was a free month. And I remember they were all over YouTube forever. And it was shortly after they were on YouTube, all of a sudden YouTube had this movie tab appear out of nowhere. So they were definitely right, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. So Max, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. What are you working on these days? What are you excited about? Well, I, uh, you know, you asked about quotes that, that I use. I've had different quotes that drive me through different phases of my life. I'm 67 now. Most people would see the, say the twilight of my career. And, um, uh, and, I, and I, I, I had no intention of slowing down or quitting, but I was edified by a, a very fine gentleman that I had to share the, the podium with, an, an, a, a, the opportunity to share the podium with a number of times. In fact, the last time we were together, I had a chance to introduce him. His name is Zig Ziglar. And uh, many of your, your viewers and listeners may know Zig. And he was a guy, one of the guys that invented motivation and positive thinking, very successful, powerful Christian. And I, uh, right before he died, he and my preacher, a guy named Ike Reichert here in Atlanta, another great American, uh, they wrote a devotional. And the first page of the devotional in January, I pick it up, and it says, from Zig and, and Ike, it says, the day your memories become bigger than your dreams, your soul begins to shrink. The day your memories become bigger than your dreams, your soul begins to shrink. And I look around, and 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 that's me. And so my goals right now are more aggressive than they've ever been. And we're launching um, Rex and Buzzy On. We're using all the rules we've learned along the way to make it just a first-class, world-class banner entry. And... um, and I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going, and we're going to grow them, and then we're going to exit them, and we're going to grow some more. And I expect to die at the at the phone or at the computer. With my, with my. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something interesting, dear. I had a nice experience this week. I was down in Tampa, Florida, which is the home office of Outback. And quite by chance, I was looking to hook up with the CEO, but I hadn't made any advance calls to him, Chris Sullivan, the founding CEO. And I asked a couple of guys if he was in town. They said they thought he might be, but he might be at his Pebble Beach house. And anyway, so I go to our flagship restaurant, Fleming's, a prime steak restaurant, uh, just to, to regroup. Uh, and it's about 5.30 or so. And I walk in, and there's only one guy sitting there at a table doing his notes, and it's Chris Sullivan, the CEO of Outback. So this is like serendipity for me. And so I had a chance to go over with him, and we just, we just caught up for a while. It was just fantastic. He's just a great human being. Now, he built out back. Uh, he is a phenomenally wealthy guy. And he's got the three restaurant concept, and we sold out. You know, he sold out. He got his money. He's still on the board. Um, he's got three restaurant co- contents launching. Wow. And, and, and he's just as excited and as invigorated as he was when he started out back. But he's just, just so much smarter. Mm-hmm. And so we were talking. I said, well, what do you think the, the, number, the number one agree with? What do you tell he was actually... He was just finishing a meeting where he was coaching another executive in Outback, a wonderful woman by the name of Martin and Andy Shaw. And I said, I said, what were you telling her about her career and about her next challenge? And he said, uh, he said, well, I used it. He said, it was the F word. I said, the F? <laughs> and he said, yeah, focus. And he, he reiterated what I, what I tell myself every day. Focus, 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 focus. Fo- it's all about focus, focus, focus. Narrow it down, focus, compartmentalize Focus, focus, focus. One challenge at a time. Prioritize them. One at a time. You can't multiple. You can't multitask. Solve multiple challenges. Compartmentalize. Focus, focus, focus. Love that. Love that. And so, uh, the answer is: the day your memories become bigger than your dreams, your soul begins to shrink. The great ones that I'm Pat Ryan, the guy who made the Forbes 400 in our lifetime, self-made. Just launched his he's about 79 years of age. Just sold out of AR and they made him retire. And just started his uh, newest insurance company. Check him out, PG P- Patrick G. Ryan. Just started his newest insurance company. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Okay, That's it's right. what we do. Yep. Okay, maybe uh, maybe uh, maybe the answer is entrepreneurship isn't what we do. Entrepreneurship is who we are. Okay. Well, 
that's a that's a key thing because I mean I was blessed. I, I never my goal was never to be a world champion of martial arts, but I was blessed to train with world champions and Olympians. And the one thing I learned is their mentality was, you know, when they show up at the competition, they're already the world champion. You don't you don't become ordained a world champion by someone else. You're already the world champion when you show up there. That's just the day the rest of the world finds out because you've optimized your life. You've got the best schedule, the best routine, the best diet, the best training partners. You are so trapped. It's almost like the quote unquote the trap of success because you know you're not going to go and win a gold medal for an event and then decide to take up ping pong as a new hobby right like you just that's who you are and i had this talk it was funny i met up with a friend yesterday when we went out and she was talking about her father and how he you know how he's money smart and invested in real estate and all this stuff and we were talking about the habits and it's the whole thing that if he didn't have those like she's like he's got more money than he knows what to do with you know and it's kind of ironic because there's all these other people that wish they had that money and we're like yeah but it's he's got the habit that's why it's not a problem for him because he has the habits and the discipline that he doesn't necessarily need it and it's that unique thing it's the same thing like if i gave you arnold schwarzenegger's body today would you have the the habits to keep it or would it just waste away and that's the same thing it's just those habits day in day in which I love what you said focus a good friend of mine uh, he always says focus follow one course until successful and I, I think that that's just that's so valid especially as entrepreneurs I think we suffer from the shiny object syndrome right because we just we sure do oh that's a killer <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you another part of that and that is that uh, one of the mentalities especially now in the technology age is this, uh, and I'm saying this as a weakness, not as a strength, that the solution to every problem is a new idea. Mm. So, mm. People stop. They, they stop on their business model. They stop p- persisting. They stop going forward. Instead of figuring out how to make that business model work, finding the right intelligence, finding the right target, they shift and they come up with another idea. Yep. And then when they hit a with roadblock, they come up with another idea. Mm. And that's not what I'm suggesting. So you're suggesting not coming up with a different idea, but to just improve the one you've got. Correct. Now, obviously, if, if it's a dead-end idea, it's a dead-end idea. But I've been with guys that cycle through 10 or 15 business models in a one-year period. Right, right. And it's they're the common denominator, right? When you look at all those models that you went through that quote-unquote didn't work, what's the common denominator? It's you. Got mm-hmm. it. Iowa, um, Des Moines, Iowa. Right. Bride is just saying goodbye. Oh, okay. Hey, listen, Doug, well, um... Yes, yes, Max. Did, did we miss anything here? No, <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. You've just got, you've got my, like, the wheels spinning, and I'm like, I'm going to be, anyways, I'm going to be reading and researching and writing and going crazy today, but, um, no, that was excellent, Max. Max, what has some been one of the most rewarding things that's happened in your career? Uh, the most rewarding thing that's happened in my career, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that to those, much is given, much is expected. And I, I believe that impacting the, creating opportunities and impacting the lives of others. Mm. And we have a recent thing. I think we probably talked about it a bit at dinner. But, we, you know, we, uh, about 10 months ago on a, on a whim, I hired a homeless guy. And uh, his name is Duke. Um, and I, I, I was trying to help him get on his feet. He he, he was a very abused child. I mean, the most abused child I'd ever run into. And um, he needed a break. I didn't know if he had a heart to, to, to change and, and, and to embrace an opportunity. So I put him through some tests and decided that I would help him. He's a big guy. He was dropped out of high school, 10th grade, because he had to support his mother, who was an alcoholic prostitute, and they were homeless. And just a horrible story. And, and so I said, well, you know, I'm going to help him get his GED. And I'll help him get a job right away at a, at a metal fabricator. He's a big six, three and a half, 350 pounds, strong guy. We'll get him, and we'll see if we can get a life. He just left his wife and, and baby son because he couldn't support them and all this. Anyway, and so I said, to him, well, I said, what do you do? What do you do for fun? And he said, well, I um, I like to play on my computer at night. I'm really good at computers. He said, I have an old one, but I've learned to get a lot out of it. And I said, well, what, what do you do? He said, well, I look to this and I try this and I experiment putting this together with that. And it just it really intrigued me. So I was going to leave, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go home. Uh, we, we just had a, an early dinner, and I said, we're starting Buzzy on. Um, I, I want you to go to the website, look at Buzzy on, then I want you to go out and find six competitors of ours for me and just do a, just do a quick analysis of them. I'm just testing them. I said, he said okay. Uh, so I stopped uh, once on the way home. So it was about an hour and a half before I got home. When I got home, um, on my computer was waiting uh, six artfully and perfectly constructed SWOT analyses of six competitors 
of um, a buzz yacht. Really? And I was floored. And so the next day I went to see him. I said, listen, uh, I was going to hire an intern for Buzzy Hunt. Uh, I'm going I'm to take a gamble on you. I'm going to pay a minimum wage until you earn your keep, and I want you to, I want you to show me your stuff. And he, he, we, I, he gave him a lot of coaching. I said, you're going to work for Jason. You, know, you met in California. And, I said, and he said, what, tell me the one piece of advice that, that I should focus on. Keep it simple. I said, make yourself invaluable. Just make yourself, do whatever there is that has to be done, make yourself invaluable. Long story short, it was the best hire I ever made. Wow. Guy's brilliant. He's working with Jason. He's launching uh, Buzzy on. We gave him the nickname. His call sign is R2D2 because he can fix anything. <laughs> <laughs> Just, he, by the way, he, he, by the way, would be a great interview for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we should set that up. Yeah, he, he will inspire you. And he's on his way. He's back with his wife and son. They're having another baby. And so uh, what, what makes me feel great, what make, makes me feel like a man, a, a great human being, seeing him prosper. Yeah, yeah, Max, I have the biggest smile on my face. I'm just so blessed and grateful to have crossed your path. Um, Max, how does anyone reach out to you if they want to connect with you or maybe even look at hiring your, your firm or, or just um, getting involved in some way? We can go through CRD. I have a very simple email. Uh, I'm comfortable with anybody reaching out to me directly, uh, and it's simply max at salestothemax.com. That's awesome. Max at sales to No letters. I mean, no numbers. It's all letters. Max, is, so right, max right. at sales to the max dot com. Well, Max, thank you so much for your time today. Um, well, what an awesome, awesome call and interview. Um, I'm definitely going to make it make a point to come down and visit you someday with Mark. Um, and just thank you, thank you for just for all you've done and been, and just again for sharing with us today. Well, thank you, buddy. You're doing the Lord's work. We really appreciate that. And anything I can do as part of the effort, reach people, help people. You want to do another podcast, let me know. If you want some other great Americans like Duke, uh, Jason Sullivan would be another great interview. And if you'd like, uh, you know, the CEO of Outback and other guys like that, um, we've got to get the word out. Just let me know. Okay. Sounds like a plan. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them, and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please, reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. Uh, you're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast, and if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself, and remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.